everyone and welcome. I am Dinka Dijkstraas from ISWA and I am introducing you to today's webinar from the Decode project, focusing on enhancing textile circularity. And the Decode project works on the recycling of coated and painted textile and plastic materials and has received funding from the European Union's 2000 Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme. ISWA is involved in Decode as the lead for the exploitation, dissemination and communication work package. Thank you for connecting with us from all around the world. In a moment, we will introduce you to the speakers of this webinar. The presentations will be followed by a question and answer session, and all participants are encouraged to type questions in the question window to your right. We will be choosing a few of these questions for the speakers to answer at the end. Before handing over to our speakers, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Veolia, the City of Rotterdam, Ecomando, and Messi Munich. They are ISWA's main sponsors, and we are very grateful for their support. A thanks also goes out to ISWA's Platinum members. Without the generosity of our sponsors and Platinum members, it would be hard to do what we do. We count on the support of our members. So if you are not yet a member, please take a moment to visit our membership page by visiting the link on the screen. You could also reach out to our membership manager, Mr. Daniel Purchase, by writing to him at dpurchase at iswa.org. We have flexible membership options with discounts for students, low-income countries, and online members. I'd like to take a brief moment to introduce ISWA, as several of you joining today are not yet members. The International Solid Waste Association, or ISWA, is a global, independent, and non-profit-making association, working in the public interest, and it is the only worldwide association promoting comprehensive and professional and sorry, comprehensive and professional waste management and the transition to a circular economy. We are open to individuals and organizations, member from the, members from the scientific community, public institutions and public and private companies from all over the world, working in the field of waste management or interested in waste management. ISWA is the only worldwide waste association that enables its members to network with professionals, companies and institutional representatives. ISWA's mission is to promote and develop sustainable and professional waste management worldwide. We have members from over 100 countries. I would now like to introduce Guy, who is the project coordinator of Decode and who will give an overview of the webinar. So Guy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello, good afternoon also from my side. As coordinator of Decode, it's a pleasure to introduce you our first webinar, which will be on enhancing textile circularity. Within the Decode project, European project, we basically focus on one specific aspect of recycling, and that is on the recycling of painted plastics, painted textiles. And this afternoon, we want to, of course, talk about the textile part, and we want to present you some of our results, but we want to do that in the wider frame why we do this uh, research. And that's basically because we want to go to textile circularity. And so for this afternoon, we prepared the following program for you. First of all, we will take a look at on European scale at where the textile sector is when it comes to circularity. That will be presented by Mauro from Euratex. Then we will have an overview, short overview of different textile recycling techniques, which will be given by Edwin from Santexpel. Then we'll also take a look at how a brand like Vaudé looks at this, that will be presented by Clément. And then we will look a bit more specific about the developments in our Decode project. We will give a short intro to the project. And then we will look at two developments specifically linked to recycling of textiles. It's on the one hand, on the one hand, the use of the Creasolve process, which will be presented by Katarina from Fraunhofer IVV. And then also a part on the use of triggerable additives for coating removal from textiles that will be presented by Ine from Sandexpo. As mentioned uh, just before, we will have our question session at the end. But I would just like to mention that for the first speaker, Umaro, we'll make an exception because he cannot stay till the end. So we'll have at the end of the presentation already a first question session. So Umaro, please feel free. Thank you, Guy, very much indeed for the introduction. Good morning or good evening, good afternoon, everybody, um, based on where you are. 
my name is Mauro Scali. I'm director of sustainable businesses in Eurotex. And I very much thanks both ISWA and the partners of the DECOAT project to um, give me this opportunity to share with you some insight what is going on on circular economy at policy level and business level in Europe. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with a uh, industry association uh, as Eurotex, a word of intro perhaps um, to let you understand why we are talking about these points and what is our point of view on these matters. So we represent the whole European textile and apparel industry, which is a very large sector, 160,000 companies in the European Union only, more than one million and a half workers. And we are the link between the industry and um, the institutions of the European Union, first and foremost, European Parliament, European Commission, so the policymakers in Europe as well as um, we liaise with other international organizations like the United Nations and the OECD. Our job is indeed to inform and advise the policymakers on what are the interests and wishes of the textile and apparel industry um, on the policy that are being designed. And that's exactly the first part of my uh, short speech today with you. Uh, we do that in close cooperation with our members in this slide here on the uh, bottom right corner you see the logo of our members the national association and also since this year we start to opening a uh, partnership with companies that are also few members um, why do we talk about textiles in the um, uh, context of the green deal or the policy because never as in these years this textile value chain has had a large and a huge relevance in policy making and that's essentially because of the environmental impact of textile products and production globally worldwide i like to quote a work from the european environmental agency um, which has published last year in november a, a good report shedding lights of what are the real impact of textile products and productions on the global scale um, and it quotes textile as the fourth most uh, relevant um, industry sectors after housing transport uh, and food um, globally so it is a very demanding textile in terms of resources because a lot of resources are consumed in textile products and productions globally speaking uh, the european union has smaller shares based on the production technologies and numbers but however, as a whole industry, we as Eurotex, we believe there is indeed a need to change the way textiles are made, used, chosen and disposed of. And that's indeed um, not only Eurotex view, it's a view of many business leaders, many companies and of course policymakers. Which take us to this point, how are the policymakers reacting to such a strong um, uh, impact globally speaking. Um, there was a very important document called the Circular Economy Action Plan released this year in March by the European Commission, which picks up on the bigger sort of overarching frame um, called Green Deal, which is a masterpiece in terms of um, a master document in terms of uh, policy making in the EU. Uh, there are a lot of information in these documents. Um, essentially, uh, what you can understand and what you can read from these uh, policy making guidelines is that there is a strong need to make sustainable products the norm to increase the sustainability of products and production processes um, for the products sold in the european market and textile is particularly one of those on top of that more recently we have seen a, a new initiatives called the next generation eu to inject a lot of funds, 750 billions of euro in the economy to restart the economy after the, pandem um, the COVID crisis, of course. Um, this would be funds not allocated to any kind of activities, but specifically to help uh, digitalization and greening restart of the economy. So we do see both a political commitment to make regulation, but also a commitment to make funds available to support this transition. And this I'll stick to this point here, and I would like to spend a couple of minutes um, to highlight, give you some insight of what are the changes that policymakers are driving towards our sectors. First of all, we are going to see, as of next year, a proposal for an eco-design directive, which would be a legislation to 
uh, proposed uh, to set minimum criteria for uh, the durability of products, including, of course, textile products, uh, the repairability, and uh, perhaps also the chemicals used in products. We might see if that also might expand to microplastic or microfibers released. So that would be a major piece of legislation, which has never happened before. Eco design applies to washing machines, for instance, but only for energy consumptions. And now it's going to go beyond that sector and beyond energy consumption. We see upcoming legislation to help consumer in choosing more sustainable products. Um, this will span through different areas from the labeling, maybe, but certainly uh, the goal is to give more information to consumer uh, to be able to choose sustainable product. For instance, recycle uh, textiles with recycled contents. And very important would be um, uh, acting in a way that greenwashing will be avoided. Greenwashing is any kind of claim where a product say, a producer says, my product is better than my competitors, but that cannot be demonstrated or substantiated with a harmonized methodology. We're going to see a digital product passport, um, potentially voluntary initiative, but which will set a way for consumers to read basic information on the products, including perhaps the origin, the chemical contents, uh, whether it is repairable, whether it is recyclable or recycled contents inside, and so on. We're going to see a so-called extended producer responsibility scheme, which is a complicated word, but already familiar in countries like Sweden and the Netherlands, and of course France, which already has one, uh, which is essentially a tax applied to a product to charge the um, company selling that product to take care of the full cycle of the product. That also implies that if products have a, a better way to um, get rid of after they have been used, they might well have less um, heavy um, levies on this tax itself. The so-called eco-modulation principle, whereby the more your product is recyclable or is a light, second light, is also reusable, the lower will be the charge applied to your product. We're going to see criteria for public procurement, because most of the points I just mentioned affect consumers like you and I, but let's not forget that the state, the administration, hospitals, armies, uniforms, um, they are massively procured by states. And for the time being, uh, there is no pressure to help them or guide them to choose a sustainable textiles, for instance. Often the price is the most important element. And then we're going to see legislation on waste, how to remove different barriers which hamper shipment of waste, textile waste across EU. And that's particularly important for the um, uh, for the upcoming pressure to change to recycle product because of the large amounts of textile waste. Now, all of that happens in very harsh economic times. Uh, we see that was in the news today as the largest UK retailers might shut down. And nonetheless, it's important to stress how the business in Europe at least is pioneering and still believes on the important circular economy. These are just examples of um, virtuous cases of companies which have already introduced circularity in their products and processes. And for Eurotex, this was fundamentally important to design our strategy. As I was mentioning before, it is our job to advise policymakers on what the business needs to remove the actual technical barriers, which today very much limit the application of circularity in textiles. We have highlighted a few points, 12 in particular, and we were also really pleased to see that many CEO of European companies have expressed their commitment to keep working on circularity and to provide advices on that. These are some of the points I mentioned when I said 12 key points. So um, it is clear that circular economy in textiles is already a reality today. And we will see a lot of cases after my presentation with a colleague speaking after myself. Um, often this is a very small portion of the whole business. And anyway, we don't see in every shop in Europe, circular solution be largely applied. So what we see here, the challenge is not so much do we want or we don't want circular economy. It is there in textile, but it's still at small scale. And we need to go at a systemic level. We need to exchange, expand this beyond single successful cases. These are some of the points that we believe uh, will help removing this barrier. 
The first one is partnerships. We all hear this word very much indeed in all presentation, but as a matter of fact, if you want to introduce chemical recycling in productions, you need um, support and technical knowledge uh, that you don't have in-house, or you need to liaise with the collection system, for instance, that is not typically inside one company. So these are really much evidence on why collaboration is so much needed, and it's the first point to enable circularity. There are many other points on which I unfortunately cannot enter in details uh, due to time constraints, um, but I would like to give you one example of one of the initiatives which puts into practice um, several of these 12 key points that I've just mentioned, and that put into practice this concept of collaboration in the value chain. This is the so-called recycling hubs, rehubs, as we short name them. Um, it is an initiative that Eurotex launched in consultation, after consultation with its members um, in a, uh, recently, a week ago about, and which has uh, as a purpose reorganized the collection sorting and recycling system for textile material, textile waste in Europe. Bottom line here, we will have in the next four years as many as five millions of tons of textile waste, um, which have to be collected uh, separately from the other waste streams and which have to be treated. And this will pose a tremendous challenge on not only on the industry, but on the administration of the city councils, if you like, uh, because currently there is no a system to treat so much of textile waste. We talk about more than five millions. And today the collection in the most advanced states is in the high magnitude of a few hundred thousands. So you do see the difference. So more textile waste will be there. We need a harmonized and organized system to collect them, to sort them, and to uh, recycle as well when reuse is no longer possible with different technologies from mechanical to chemical recycling. So that is the proposal that UATL has launched. Um, the mission statement is indeed to launch uh, five recycling hubs in European Union territories, which will serve different member states to again organize the collection, sorting, um, uh, treatment of the sexual waste to generate new raw materials and create new jobs by doing all of that within the European Union. Um, we're going to publish more information about that. It is an open initiative and we've been extremely pleased by the large feedback we have received also on social media on these initiatives because that really shows that um, with the small volumes and the small numbers there is really little which can be done. You just don't realize even the uh, achieved economy of scale that you need for the investments are needed for such a, an activity. So this is an initiative to call for our collaboration uh, with a different value chain, recycling, textile, and chemicals, if you like, uh, as well as retailer, to um, put this into practice and make it happen. In the interest of time, I am going to stop in a few, in a few moments. Um, I still very much welcome any question that any of you might wish to post in the chat. Um, the organizing is what colleagues told me that it's possible to uh, type questions um, on any of the points that I just mentioned, and I'm going to have a look at the chat as soon as I finish uh, this, this few slide. This is my, my final point. I wanted to conclude uh, with some takeaway messages. Um, again, I, I like to stress that textile circularity is already happening in many different ways all over Europe and even, of course, beyond Europe, but that's, that's uh, where the priorities lies in the moment, also supported by policymakers. The challenge is to go up, to scale up from small scale production to a major portion of the business models. This challenge is to reward frontrunner companies while helping other companies in dealing with the challenge, which again, in very harsh economic time, uh, is very much difficult for other SME in the textile value chain to comply, to, to adjust with. The second point, um, we believe we need to look at this policy attention of the Green Deal and the Circular Economy Action Plan as an opportunity uh, for recovery. Our job will be to advise the institution and to bring together the business actors uh, to make this opportunity really translate as such. 
And we believe as long as the policymaker also will pay attention to the real needs of the business, of the community, research community supporting it, uh, that can actually be a very successful transition. And last point, as I just mentioned, um, we need joint initiatives. The recycling hubs is one of those, uh, even this, this very uh, project, DECOET, which gave us today the chance to speak together, it's an opportunity, it's a, an example of showing how collaboration, the value chain can be put into practice. And uh, we believe we need more than that. And I think I will stop here in my only 15 minutes available. I'm gonna quickly look at the chat in case any question um, has been posted. So bear with me. I'm also using this tool for the first time. I see one question um, regarding the textile strategy. The question is, how do I think the textile strategy will help having waste becoming secondary raw material? Um, it's, it's a very pertinent question. When it comes to the textile strategy, um, this can refer to two things. If we talk about the European Union textile strategy, which I haven't mentioned, but it's an overarching policy that the Commission will launch after summer next year, uh, that clearly implies that uh, there will be, at least based on what we know so far, there, there is an, a political intention to put incentives for um, recycling and recycled material to be part of the normal production line of, of textile products. There will be incentives, there will be uh, financial opportunities there, there will be the opportunity to explain what today needs to be changed in the, for instance, uh, in the definition of waste itself, in the criteria that perhaps a region in France and a region in Italy use to define what a waste is. Uh, because if we don't change the law, we can't even have this potentially secondary raw material to go from one place to the other. More important than that, we need to have uh, technological changes. We need to build up a, an infrastructure allowing reverse logistic. So not only um, products going to factories, but fact, um, raw materials, uh, sorry, waste, going back to a production system to be used as secondary raw materials. And we will also need testing these technologies at a large scale to, um, to actually become raw materials. After that, we also need to incentivize the demand for secondary raw material. Nowadays, we know that there is a lot of demands from the buying side, in the fashion, in the apparel side, but also in other value chains um, to purchase uh, recycled materials. But there are, of course, issues in terms of performance and quality, um, as well as the demand is still limited. So, still answering this question, another way to incentivize secondary raw material, ways to become secondary raw material, is to uh, create a demand, increase the demand for this raw material to be chosen by, again, consumers, other industry, other value chain, and other um, and public procurers. I don't see other question for the time being. There's a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, let me just get the first one for you. Uh, first question is, when will the eco-design guidelines be released? Um, to be careful about the word, it will not be guidelines, it will be legislation, which is way more bigger than that. Um, we expect the Commission to launch what they call public consultation, so to give ideas on how this regulation might take place or this legislation might be made. And this is expected to be starting uh, early next year, mid next year. So the Commission will put down some proposals based on the information they already are collecting, such as the UATF strategy that I mentioned and those of other stakeholders. And the actual proposal for legislation could be tabled down still next year. Thank you. And then another question. Um, do you have a protocol to identify emerging contaminants in textiles? Hmm. That is a very good question. Um, there is right now a very strong activities on chemicals. Um, on sustainable chemicals and on control of the heart of those chemicals. Uh, the business in itself has its own procedure to control the um, heart of those chemicals in production. There is many systems, uh, this, is, this is normal, this is everyday business. There will be new criteria to identify hazardous chemicals that will come from legislation, will not come from the business. 
And our job will be to uh, understand what the niche new criteria will be uh, and what will be the impact on the whole value chain. Because of course, textile doesn't make chemicals, but use chemicals for the product, products and productions. Thank you very much. Um, please, uh, Mara, if you can have a look at the chat to uh, as there's a couple more questions, but unfortunately we have to move on with the next presentation as well. So thank you very much. Very good. So I will under I understand I will address this question. Uh, you want me to address them now or to address them separately? In the chat or uh, yeah, in the chat would be best. Okay. But then we'll move on with the next presentation. If you have time, you can uh, answer the question in the chat. We will look into that and we'll try to give a reply to the colleagues. Perfect. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. So then uh, I would now like to welcome uh, Edwin from Suntex Bell, who will be giving an overview of textile recycling techniques. Um, Edwin? Good afternoon, I'm um, Edwin Maas, one of the consultants at uh, Centex Bell, the Belgian uh, Textile and Artificial Materials Institute. And uh, one of my, uh, an important part of my job is to follow up on everything that is a circular economy. And I'm also participating in a number of projects regarding the circular economy. Um, I want to start my presentation with um, something H&M will install in their shops, in one of their the flagship shops. Uh, it is a production line where you input a piece of garment and after four hours, uh, as I understood, you will have a, a new garment. Um, this is a great uh, tool to, to uh, raise awareness. And, and a great marketing tool, but if this is a thing that is economically feasible and doable, um, I will not judge this, but uh, after my presentation, please reflect uh, on this. So where are we regarding uh, recycling? If you look to, to the circular economy, um, we are in the tech cycle, uh, the, the most outer loop. Uh, and also in, in the bio cycle, uh, when, when you uh, talk about uh, making feedstocks for chemicals. So I will talk about sorting, mechanical, thermal, dissolving, chemically depolymerization, biological depolymerization and facilitating technologies um, within this presentation. So, this is not really recycling, but it is often a very important step uh, that we will split up the uh, textile waste streams. Um, first of all, to uh, select those articles that can be reused or refurbished. And secondly, to, to have uniform waste streams, uh, which is for a lot of technologies very important. Um, this can be done not manually or automatically, um, for instance, with infrared analysis, you can split up uh, waste streams. The problem with that is that it's still not 100% correct. Um, there are a lot of pixel products with, with uh, blends, so um, those products uh, end up sometimes in, in the wrong uh, section. The first real um, recycling technology is mechanical recycling, which uh, has been done all, already for quite some time. Uh, it's possible on all fiber types, uh, also possible on blends, and there are no chemicals involved, which um, makes it probably the, the, the most ecological way of recycling. But um, the outcome, they are only a, a small percentage of um, fibers that you can reuse for spinning. So when it comes to like non movements for isolation materials, also coatings and so on are not an issue, but to, to really gain fibers to spin a yarn again, um, there's only like for genes, uh, about 10% of, of fibers coming out of a gene spans that you can use within a spinning production again. So there are a lot of fiber fragments that are not usable for spinning and also hard parts uh, that are hopefully separated from out of it. So issues are, like I said, um, all sorts of, of uh, products that 
contaminate these textile waste streams. Um, Aramid fibers, um, so some fibers can give problems uh, during uh, this procedure so that you need special machines to separate or uh, shred these, these materials. And also there's an uh, uncertain outcome depending on what you put in. Uh, often uh, the fiber content is, is very uncertain. Um, a company that was very successful within this technique is, is Utex Bell. They will bring into the market together with uh, garment manufacturers, garment for the hospital, uh, for, for medical uh, caretakers um, that consist out of uh, about 60% polyester and then uh, cellulosic fibers, all your cell cotton. And from that 60% um, polyester fibers, 60% is mechanically recycled. Um, but you see to maintain a certain quality that they still need uh, fibers from another source. So like open source pet bottles. Um, so they come from outside the textile uh, industry. That's uh, why we say open source. Um, this is only possible because those garments have a, a huge number of uh, washing cycles. So after 100, 120 washing cycles, the cotton is completely dead and will pulverize during the recycling and spinning. So that's why you end up with these, these polyester fibers. From the moment you will try to recycle better garments or other garments, probably you will have issues. So it's very important that you have a value chain collaboration. And this, this is often the case that you need everybody within the value chain to work together. The next uh, recycling technology is um, actually melting down plastics like the artist you see uh, in the picture. And um, it's actually all thermoplastic fibers you can melt down and spin again into a, a fiber. Sometimes you need chemicals to, to uh, improve the, the end result like compatibilizers, uh, those are used when you have a contamination of a, another material, uh, another thermoplastic uh, material uh, that doesn't blend in well. Uh, they make sure that those two materials um, stick together and you have a better quality. Uh, the outcome is, is a fiber from the same polymer. So uh, you will limit the, the, the material change with this technique. Um, there is a degradation of the polymer. Uh, this degradation you don't have for the mechanical. There you have mechanical damages done uh, to your fiber. Uh, contamination of foreign materials and chemicals uh, is an issue because they remain inside uh, the polymer in a lot of cases. Uh, this is in the market from for some materials, uh, but often, like for mechanical recycling, uh, there's version material or open source material included into the fiber to maintain a certain quality level. Uh, one of, of uh, an example of a fiber is the Iveron uh, fiber from uh, Antex. Then we go over to dissolving. Here you will um, dissolve uh, a fiber into a chemical and you will try to keep the polymer intact or, or change it at as less as possible. Uh, this is only possible on dissolvable uh, fibers, uh, possible also on blends in the future. There are quite some research projects that focus on blends. And this technique will, will, be, will be one of the main techniques to, to solve the problem of uh, fiber blends. Um, I told you already that the polymer stays mostly intact. You get, uh, in, as an end result, uh, almost virgin fibers or virgin fibers. And, and in most cases, um, so not always, but in most cases, you get a different fiber. Uh, Think about when you start from a cotton fiber and you end up with the Leo cell fiber. Uh, issues are to find a, a suitable solvent to dissolve the, uh, the fiber. 
uh, contaminations of other materials, um, contamination also of the solvent in a closed loop system. So there are sometimes uh, uh, washing residues or dye stuff that might pollute your solvent and you want to try to reuse your solvent uh, so you don't try, want uh, these products in your solvent. Uh, they are limited available in the market and most of the cases are cellulosic regenerated fibers. Uh, also, it is only a certain percentage of the fiber uh, that is uh, recycled. Two examples of this are the refibra fiber and the circulose fiber. The circulose has 50% uh, uh, end-of-life uh, cotton fibers. Uh, as, as it has been used as a pulp. Uh, and for the refibra fiber, this is uh, production waste where they go to one third uh, of the production waste. But there are a lot of researches done within this domain. So this is evolving very quickly and um, estimated by the year of 23, uh, a lot of new fibers within this domain probably are on the market. Chemically depolymerization. Here you will break down your polymer chain into monomers or uh, oligomers. Uh, so you will break down the polymer chain completely or partially. And this can be done on, on fibers uh, where, where that can be depolymerized and the focus is there mainly on man-made fibers, all the polys, polyester, polyamide, and so on. Um, these, these particles can then, after purification, uh, be the source of a new virgin fiber and then most uh, contaminations are gone, uh, so there are a lot less issues. Uh, because you end up with, with the virgin fiber, uh, this is uh, a very useful um, uh, recycling technology when all the others uh, are not possible anymore. Um, so this is at the early stage uh, for many polymers. Um, it's available in the market for polyamide 6, so only the six, uh, but there are a lot of research projects uh, focusing on this topic. So one of uh, the polyamide six is Econil by Aquafil, and on their website, you can find an interesting interview of the CEO uh, explaining that if he knew when back then, when they started uh, on, on this technology this many years ago, that he, uh, what, what he knows now, that he probably would not have started at all because it's so complex. So another uh, polyester recycling, recycling of working garments will be uh, researched within the Certex project. And we hope then also to have a product on the market by uh, 23. Then there is an other way than chemical uh, depolymerization. This is biological depolymerization. Certain microorganisms can attack the, the polymer chains of fibers. Um, this can be also done, for instance, on polyester with an enzyme. So uh, you perhaps might not expect this. Um, to also break them down in monomers that can be then after purification used to produce virgin materials. It is then uh, an issue, of course, to find a suitable microorganism. And it is in a very early stage, this technology. Uh, it's already done, if I'm correct, in PET bottles. But PET bottles uh, don't have a lot of chemicals inside them. So I'm wondering how uh, the microorganism might, might uh, react to the chemicals present in textiles and also if, if this technique is not very time consuming uh, but the research will probably tell us that. Uh, Carbios is a, a company uh, from France that is already uh, depolymerizing polyester with uh, enzymes. Then there are a lot of facilitating technologies that could um, make your material more pure. There are, for instance, two um, sewing fibers. One is the where to go that disintegrate um, 
uh, because of uh, microwaves. So if, if you put the textile product in a microwave, even at home, uh, but then please be sure there are no met metal buttons or, or, or metal zippers on it. And the, the fiber will disintegrate and you can take all the pieces off uh, that you have soon on with this, um, with, this, with this yarn. So this is also investigated or will be used within the Surtex uh, project. For, for instance, to uh, put on a reflection striping on a jacket that is made of 100% polyester that then will be recycled. The other one is Resortex. Um, this is a, a yarn that disintegrates from a certain temperature on. So the, the yarn also breaks up then and you can take this, uh, the different parts um, uh, or separate the different parts in a garment or another product like a shoe. Um, I'm, I'm convinced that you will need a lot of uh, technologies and that every technology will be very suitable for a certain type of products. So I don't see them really as a competitor. Um, what I want to give uh, to you as a takeaway, and I hope uh, you understood this, is that uh, there's not one tech solution. Um, you might start with mechanically or thermal recycling and then go on uh, over to chemical recycling after you have done this a couple of times and, and your material is disintegrated too much. So you need to chemically recycle your, your fiber. Um, there's much more uh, research and upscaling needed um, before a lot of technologies will be fully available in the market. And value chain collaboration is very important. You need to take your consumer along the road uh, when, when you are developing those uh, technologies. And there are still a lot of possibilities still to, to be discovered. So if you then look back to what H&M um, developed, um, do you think this is the, 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 the most suitable uh, solution for your textiles? Um, so hereby, I want to conclude um, my presentation. And I don't know, um, I know there's a Q&A uh, after all the presentations. Uh, so perhaps if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we can come back to you. Thank you, Edwin. So um, I would now like to welcome Clément for the next presentation um, and he will be sharing insights from Vaudé. Yeah, thank you, Dinke. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, so my name is Clément Fuller. I'm a material engineer at Vaudé. Uh, so we are a sport, outdoor sport brand. And uh, yeah, today I'd like to present you kind of um, what textile circularity means and our perspective from a brand. So really like uh, uh, a company in direct contact with end users. And I think it's interesting because we're really confronted between what uh, the civil society expects, uh, what our consumers expect of us. We have our own vision and in the same time we are limited or pushed by what, uh, what the industry is able to do. And we have to kind of deal with all of this. So that's really going to be about what we want and what we can do and what's what's the vision we're aiming for. Uh, but first, I can say a few words about the company to set things up. So Vaudé, uh, kind of German name, we are uh, located in uh, southern Germany, not too far from the, the foot of the Alps, the feet of the Alps. We are an outdoor sport gear manufacturer. Um, so we started as a backpack company back in the 70s, very traditional company. And uh, in 2009, the daughter of the founder of the company took over and she was really pushing for a more environmental uh, philosophy in the company. And that's how we started a bit uh, being interesting in those type of topics, starting with uh, sustainability on the local side, in the company, but right now we are more pushing it on, on the product side. 
And of course, sustainability for us, it means uh, an environmental part, some social parts and uh, the economics with it. And we work on very different topics at the moment for us. We're working a lot on the environmental side with the material we're using. But we see that uh, the, the circularity, the end of life of our textile products is going to be definitely a challenge uh, in the decade to come. Um, maybe one point about our world of sports. We're um, having both summer and winter sports and uh, divided into three big categories. We have what we call mountain sports. So in summer, more hiking, winter ski touring, which is like the traditional area. A second uh, area which is really growing at the moment is everything with bike, mostly mountain bike, uh, a bit of road bike, travel bike, and a final uh, category, which is more some urban uh, commuting at the moment uh, with a lot of athleisure. And we, we have a lot, a very wide portfolio of products in this. As you can see, mostly textile, what we call soft goods. And for us as a auto sport, uh, manufacturer, so we see it very technical products. That's our core uh, skill. And this is something uh, our customer also expect from the product. We have to be functional, we have to work well. And that's why we usually in our textile add uh, in the past more blends. So trying to increase durability or uh, different properties by mixing different materials. And also using a lot of coatings uh, for a textile, always to try to improve some properties, uh, mostly um, yeah, waterproofing or uh, abrasion resistance, things like that. So we are a very big user of coatings. As I said, it brings, uh, it brings really uh, the properties better of the, the material. We, are, we use a very widespread range of different techniques be it film lamination, art melt coating, or uh, solvent base and everything. And we have to keep the functional side. The coating is really bringing some properties, but in the same time, uh, our products have to look stylish. So we have here very high requirements to be functional. And in the same time, it has to look good. It has to feel soft. It has to be lightweight. And uh, part of our really, um, what we are uh, always pushing is to, to be at the limit where can we achieve the best of both worlds. And that's also something which makes uh, for us uh, difficult. We have, a, we have a lot of things to handle at the same time. And so when we're talking about those textile, focusing about the end of life, the first thing uh, which is almost obvious for us as a as really outdoor mountain sports uh, brand is the durability. Um, for us, making the most durable products is always synonymous synonymous of uh, of sustainable products, and that's also maybe why a lot of uh, those mountain sport brands are kind of like at the spearheading for uh, sustainability. Um, actions because uh, we have a tendency to to be always involving in those area. And how we we translate this really in our products, we have two big uh, two big sectors where we work a lot, and I think we are also quite at the forefront of this. Is uh, we are having some uh, second hand um, opportunities. Uh, Vaudi has some type of uh, renting system for a very uh, expensive products, backpacks, tents, or so on, but still at a very small scale, which will hopefully evolve in the future. And we also have a lot of uh, uh, partnerships for secondhand uh, sale of Vaudi products, like on eBay with uh, special channels. Behind this, it's really the idea that we see that our product has a high value because it's used a lot of resources and a lot of energy to manufacture our products. And this value, we want to see that it makes sense to keep it as, as long as possible in the use phase. And beside secondhand, of course, what we have a very uh, 
pushed a lot is repairability of the products. So we're working internally to make sure that the products are always uh, repairable. We have a special index for that. We have in our company also a repair service where customers can send their products when they're under guarantee warranty. We can repair them and even after we repair all the products, all the Vardy products. And we also partner with some special uh, actions to, uh, for example, iFixit, which is a website. It allows you to repair your products uh, alone on your own and uh, explaining with uh, tutorials and things like that. So really like this reuse, reusing products, keeping the value in, in, the, in the cycle is the first rule, so to speak. But then it brings us definitely also on the second stage, what can we do when, when the product is uh, maybe broken where you cannot use it anymore when you don't want it and it doesn't go, doesn't fit. And usually uh, what we have here in Europe was kind of a collection uh, bin for textile. And then they're either given back to charities or uh, recycled, uh, mostly I think downcycling for insulation uh, fillers and things like that. From our side, we also have actually running a, a, a partnership with one of those collection system, uh, Fairwertung, because that's a company with we, whom we have a good uh, connection and a good uh, understanding about what we see as uh, social uh, sustainability. But definitely we ask ourselves, okay, we want to go further from that. What is the next stage? And for this, we said that the first rule would be durability, but the second rule that we see setting ourselves is really to recycle and keep the materials kind of uh, material to material recycling, not going for landfill or either energy recovery. And this is where uh, we still see challenges. Um, what's good is, as we said, we have a, a products which we think have, have value. So we think which could be really interesting to recycle. The challenge here is more What's the good thing for the first rule, the durability? People tend to forget that they have a, a jacket hanging in the closet since 10 years. And so they forget they, they don't uh, wear it anymore, but they don't know where they bought it. They don't know what brand it is anymore. And usually we have, uh, we have trouble tracking uh, where the product ends up. And that's also something we, uh, we made the experience from back in the, in the 90s we developed our own tech back system for a monomaterial auto jacket, which was made almost entirely of, uh, of PET. And we offered like a customers to, uh, to send back the jacket so that we can recycle them back into some, uh, some plastic trims. And the problem was that we never get, got a lot of, uh, a lot of product back. Um, and I think that's, that's really a, bo a bottleneck for us, this kind of a collection sorting, uh, where at the moment we have huge troubles to, to organize and to scale up this kind of thing in order to, to prepare for this type of recycling. So for us, that's a clear indication we've made from experience that we need some critical volume in order to, to uh, collect things and to have a more interesting um, business proposal. And that's based on these facts, um, we came up to some kind of uh, uh, what we see as still as challenges and maybe how we can sort those out. So after this collection uh, difficulties, what we see important for us to do is to work up how we can design our products to make them as, as easily recyclable as possible. What we called eco-design is still in, uh, in development for us internally because this eco design, we are really have to go hand in hand with um, with keeping our functionality and our performance, and that's a very critical point. As I said, we want to keep durable products, and that means if we have a coating to uh, make a textile waterproof, if we don't have this coating at the moment, the textile is not waterproof. We don't have the good properties 
So it doesn't make sense to, to have the, the, the product in the first place. So those two really have to go hand in hand. And that's why we see uh, really a need for, for new technologies to allow us to uh, recycle those kind of difficult, uh, diffi difficult to recycle materials like, um, like Edwin mentioned before. And that's where also why we're part of the, the Decode project, which uh, will be presented by other speakers later. This is something we identify really as a need helping us to go on the on next stage. Then uh, the, maybe the step before, I didn't organize that very well in my, my slide, but the collection and the sorting are for us um, parts where we do not have experience and where we see really some kind of uh, something lacking at the moment. We're really always having too many hurdles to organize something. And that's why we usually, uh, it's too much work, too much trouble, and we, we don't uh, get things running. So at this stage, we, uh, we think really, uh, that's also something a lot of other speakers have talked about, some kind of a synergy, and really thinking like uh, we are an industry, like the sports textile industry, and we all are aiming for the same, for the same objective. So that's really something which we should all work together on it. And that we're with our own uh, weight, we're trying to push to get things moving in this direction. And in the end, um, what I wanted to, to leave you with is we have a vision to, to um, reach really uh, textile to textile circularity. That's what we would really aim. That means having our own uh, textile materials, a very long uh, life cycle, and then in the end, be able to recycle those in a closed loop. And this is a point where at the moment uh, we are compromising. We, we're trying to find solutions to, to support this vision, but that's only gonna come out with uh, the, the good, good enough quality, the availability so that uh, we have a lot of choices and uh, something that uh, previous speaker also spoke about, the regulations to help us bridge those gaps. And on that note, I'm gonna leave you there. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Clément. So I would now like to welcome back Guy to give an, uh, person, an introduction to Decodes. Thank you. So as mentioned in the beginning, Decode is a European project and we really fully focused on recycling of coated plastics and coated textiles. And I guess given the previous presentation, I think you already saw that coated textiles can be very important and are widely used for quite a different range of uh, applications. But also in other sectors, we encounter a lot of coated items. One of the partners we have in Decode is also looking, for example, at automotive parts but it's quite common but for example also for light switches and other electronics we often have coated items when it comes to recycling they pose really a difficulty because let's say by definition it are two different materials you have the substrate you have the coating so if you want to recycling um, they have to be separated there are different ways to look at it to do that within decode the idea we want to uh, promote and work out is let's say fitting in the philosophy of eco-design in the sense that when we apply the coating, we will already take into account that at end of life, the coating has to be removed from the substrate. And in order to do that, we foresee typically a kind of, yeah, let's see it, release layer that can be a separate layer or it can be integrated in the coating. And the idea is basically that we integrate some additives in the coating that can be triggered. This trigger can be, for example, thermal or could be microwave. So during the lifetime of the product, of course, the addition of these additives should not have any influence. The coating should behave as it should. It should not have a negative effect on, for example, aesthetic properties or on technical performance. But then at end of life, when one can apply this trigger, then one can separate the coating from the substrate so that both elements can be separately recycled. That's roughly the idea. How we see that in practice, if you look at the 
let's see, the lifetime of a product, then we can start with the product in use. It's exemplified here by the bus, the backpack, and the light switch. And then at end of life, the first step could be to um, disassemble the parts. So you see that in the upper left corner. And there, this technology of triggered coatings, triggered adhesive, can help to disassemble. Then these parts can be further um, separated, sorted, and also grinded with the idea that after a um, yeah, step for making it smaller for grinding, one can sort the particles depending on the trigger and then, of course, apply the trigger. So at that moment, one can really remove the, the coating from the substrate. Once that's done, the parts can follow a more or less standard way of recycling be it a mechanical recycling or a chemical recycling, and to that way close the loop. So that's roughly the concept that we have. In order to do that, or how we translated that in the project into key objectives is shown here. So we start from the normal use now of the material, where we start with raw materials, with chemicals, we make coated product parts. These are integrated in actual products. And at end of life, we typically go to landfill or incineration. But we first of all say, okay, we need to add one building block, the part of enabling recycled coated parts, and then we can come to closed loop use of the materials. In order to do that, we have to really work at the different steps along the value chain or along the lifetime. And that is shown here. So already on the development of the materials. So we need to look into these additives. We need to do synthesis of certain particles. They can be added then to the coating, so we have to develop a coating system. Then we integrate it in the product. That might uh, imply that the design of the product might slightly have to be altered, but we have to rethink the way so that at the end of life um, we can recycle it. But of course, it also means that we have to recognize the trigger for that waste product and in the project, therefore, we work also on optical uh, sorting methods for this. And then once the parts are separated, they can be recycled. We are trying to combine more classical, like for example, mechanical recycling uh, with extra elements so that uh, the trigger can be applied. And then the final objectives in the project is that we want to really demonstrate the circular use of the material. So doing, showing the technical feasibility and also do an environmental and economical assessment of uh, this process. That's a lot of work. So basically not one single partner, I think, can do that alone. That's why we have a consortium. Do not want to go into details here. We just say that we have roughly four different types of partners. We have, first of all, the end users, like Fode. I think that's really important because they know what is out there at the market, they know what they're confronted with. And basically, we try to develop solutions for them uh, from R&D side, but also together with uh, technology providers. And in order to do the exploitation, the dissemination of the project, we also have some dedicated partners. And you might recognize our um, organizer, our host for this afternoon, Iswa. And with that, I would like to stop and give back the word to Dinky. Thank you, Guy. And um, so I would now like to welcome Katarina, who will be discussing the Kriasov process. Yes, thank you very much, Dinke. So my name is Katarina Kaiser. I work at the Fraunhofer IVV. And in my department, we are dealing with recycling processes, especially focusing on the Kriasov process. And uh, now in my presentation, I will um, give an overview about the Kriasov process in textile recycling. So first of all, Edwin already mentioned it a little bit. Um, I want to clarify what kind of recycling the Kriasov process is, because since solvents are involved, people always tend to think that we are chemical recycling, but this is not the case. Actually, um, the polymer stays intact during the recycling process in a certain range. So after the recycling process, we still have polymer chains left. I'm not going to go into detail about um, bigger differences between the um, different recycling methods because Edwin already gave a very good overview on this. Yes, 
project. So now I will explain the um, individual steps of the CreaSolve process. In the beginning, we have a waste stream we want to treat. And um, this waste stream is supposed to have a significant amount of thermoplastic polymers or one thermoplastic polymer inside. Because um, we need thermoplastic polymers since cross-linked polymers cannot be dissolved. So they have to be non-cross-linked. And um, the waste streams we, um, that make sense to be treated with the CreaSolve process are typically those waste streams that cannot be recycled with the um, classical mechanical recycling methods. So for example, we have um, commingled waste streams, um, which as Edwin already explained, are not um, able to be, re be recycled with um, the classic met methods or composite materials that um, are formed of different materials in, in combination. And one another, um, Typical waste stream we treat is um, are, are materials that have um, additives inside, for example, flame retardants that cannot be removed um, with classical um, recycling methods, but they can be removed with the CreaSolve method. So um, in the first step, um, we have a dissolution step. And um, for this purpose, we have different solvents and different solvent mixtures also, which selectively dissolve individual polymers. And um, then those dissolved polymers can be separated from the non-dissolved parts. So we have a residue and a polymer solution. The polymer can be regained from the solution, for example, by precipitation. And afterwards, we have to dry the polymer and can reprocess, us, reprocess it. The, um, Solvent has to be distilled and be recovered so we can use it again. So we have a closed loop for the, um, for the solvent. Um, the CreaSolve process as it is depicted in this picture and as I explained it to you now, was the, let's call it classical CreaSolve process. Um, in this way, we use it, for example, for um, packaging waste for example, mixed packaging fractions that cannot be sorted any better, or where we have a multi-layer packages that cannot be recycled either. And in those fractions, we usually have, um, for example, polyethylene, which has the highest amount in those fractions. And then we would dissolve the polyethylene and regain it from the solution. Um, in other cases, the filtration residues might be um, the materials that we aim for in our recycling. Um, this is the case, for example, if we have one bulk material and only a small amount of a thermoplastic um, polymer that prevents this material from being recyclable. This is the case with many um, of the decode input materials because we have a bulk material and then there's the coating. And this coating can be removed from the substrate if it is thermoplastic by dissolution. Um, another use case also um, in in the decode process is um, if then we have um, cross-linked coatings and those also can be removed, for example, by dis dissolving a primer that is underneath or by swelling the, um, the coating. And those three examples of the CreaSolve process, I will present now in examples. Yes, the use case number one is we have a textile, which for example is coated with a PVC coating. The PVC is thermoplastic and so we can dissolve it from the um, fabric. And um, here the, the fabric can be removed from the solvent by just one filtration step. We will have the textile then, which is of course wet afterwards, so we have to make a drying step. And in a degassing step during the um, regranulation, we can then remove the final um, residues of the solvent and we have the regrained, uh, regained substrate. Um, the coating also can be removed, if this is what you want, um, from the solution again. So um, this could also be regained if this is aimed for. But as we all know, there are not only um, thermoplastic coating, but also cross-linked ones, and those are not able to be um, dissolved. So um, we have to find another method, and um, this is possible by finding the right solvent, solvent which is able to swell the coating, for example. 
By swelling, the coating loses its adhesion to the fabric and it will delaminate from the, um, from the textile. Um, again, we do a filtration to remove the solid parts from the solvent. But in this case, now we will have the um, coating and the fabric together in one mixed fraction. So we will need a further separation step to separate those two materials from each other. This, for example, can be done by um, wind sifting, if it is possible, for example, because the coating rolls up or maybe it is tacky, or maybe also um, density separations are good options for this if the densities between the coating and the fabric is, um, is significantly different. And afterwards, the material is dry, uh, is wet again, and so we have to dry it in two steps and we can regain the material. Um, those two cases are um, worked on in the decode project, but we also have um, one other option to um, treat um, textile waste in, um, with the Creosolve process. And um, this would be the um, solution of the fabric is itself. And this, for example, could make sense if we have more uh, mixed um, waste streams again, or maybe also mixed fabrics, for example, a um, mixture of um, cotton and polyester. And in those cases, it would be possible to dissolve the polyester. And then again, like I explained to you before, um, regain it from the solution. Um, in our institute, we have a small um, technical plant where we can do this not only in the lab, but also in a bigger scale, as you can see it on the picture already. So, um, yes, I am already at my conclusion. And the things I want you to remember are um, that the Creosolve process is not a chemical recycling process, but the polymer chains remain intact and um, that there is not one single form of the Creosolve process. There, um, the Creosolve process always have to, has to be um, adapted to the material and, ha and um, how it behaves in the process. And so um, it always has to be um, checked whether um, what material should be dissolved and what is better to be in the residue. So we always have to check every single input to see how we um, treat it the most efficiently. Then maybe what's also important to know to you is that um, for a commercial plant to um, to run this to, to run a commercial plant um, cost efficiently, we need round about um, five thousand tons per year. And this is actually what Clément already um, explained that those five thousand tons have to be localized at one place. So the challenge always is to, to, to gather those materials at one place. And I think especially with um, clothing, this is quite a difficult task to do um, because it's not as short living as packaging is. So um, yes, this is one of the bottlenecks in the um, textile recycling, I guess. And then what's also interesting to know maybe for you is that um, we are not only working in our lab and in our small technical scale, um, plant, but um, there are also commercial plants being implemented right now. We are um, building one for polyethylene from packaging in Germany. Those are the sorting residues that cannot be um, processed with the mechanical recycling and also one for polystyrene in the Netherlands, um, which is contaminated with um, flame retardants. And um, yes, this is already it. And if you have questions afterwards in the Q&A session, I will be glad to answer them. And thank you very much. Thank you, Katharina. Um, I would now like to welcome Ine for the final presentation. Uh, Ine will be discussing triggerable additives for coating room. Thank you, Dinke. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Ine de Velder and I work at Centexpels as a research scientist and I'm involved in the decode project. Um, and I will tell you a little bit more on the triggerable additives for coating removal. Um, so I'll first deepen a little bit on the materials we are discussing. Also highlight a little bit on the recycling concept and give you some first results we obtained within the project. 
So um, coated textiles, so what kind of materials are we aiming at? You can see they're quite abundant in our daily lives, as he already mentioned, and they're also quite uh, varied. So it can go from a carpet up to a camping tent. It can be architectural textile. Um, and then, of course, the products of Faudet, for example, with raincoats, bike bags, and things like that, but also uh, um, uh, mattress covers in hospitals and so on. So you can see it's very diverse range of textile. So why do we use the coatings? It's actually to give a functional performance um, to the uh, materials like waterproofness or improve the re abrasion resistance. So it's really to add to meet the requirements during the use phase of the product. Which kind of materials are these? It was already mentioned, it can be PVC, polyurethane, acrylic ones, it can be silicones and so on. So why um, does these coated materials pose an issue for recycling? It's actually because this coating acts as an impurity in the recycling process and it really prevents recycling. So nowadays these objects end up in landfill or are incinerated. A first solution is that we would produce um, these materials in monomaterials, meaning that the bulk material and the coating will exist out of the same material. For example, a PE fabric with a PE coating. But this is not always possible in practice because often the functional requirements are not met if we compose the materials in this way. Um, we estimate that every year around 350 kilotons of waste is generated, so there are quite huge amounts. Um, at Centexpel, in the past, there have been running some projects to deal with these um, materials. So the European FP7 project Ecometex and the Flemish project Recicode, and they both looked how to debond different layers in carpets. So here you see a picture where, for example, a carpet is put in boiling water and after 30 seconds you can see that the bitumen backing nicely separates from uh, the piles and this is done by adding also additives into the coating layer. And within Decode actually we want to broaden the field of the layer separation so not only looking at carpets but looking at all kinds of other textile products. You have seen this passing by already in Gipe's presentation, so I will not go into too much detail on this. So I will focus next actually on the custom made triggers we will put in the primer layer and that will be triggered um, via heat or steam, microwave or moist. Um, so this is an overview of the different materials we are looking at in Decode. The uh, first one is a core shell material. So that means that you have some kind of capsule where the core can be liquefied um, when it's exposed to higher temperatures. And this will uh, have an internal pressure and at a certain point the shell will weaken, uh, the, the capsule will burst and this will lubrify a little bit the coating and hopefully we can release it after that. A second way is by putting super absorbing polymers um, into uh, the, and also in capsule form into the primer layer. And when these come into contact with moist, they will start to swell. And then we hope that we can have a separation in that way. We can also add magnetic particles or carbon nanotubes, which are absorbed on silica um, into the coating. And these materials can be triggered by a microwave. They will heat up and then also then via the heating will um, reduce the strength of the coating and then we can remove it. And a fifth principle is the INDAR technology of Fresco and what they're doing this upon temperature um, increase the additives will decompose and they will form a gas and this gas will trigger the debonding. So we start uh, in the project with the generic screening. We just took a simple polyester woven fabric and we coat it with some standard textile binders, uh, polyurethane and acrylic ones. And we're just producing a four size typical lab scale samples. Um, the first problem we encountered actually, how can we assess the efficiency of the different triggers? So how we can assess the efficiency of the bonding um, because we actually need to have a uniform and a reproducible way to uh, apply for example a scratch 
the problem is, is you do it manually, you will always have a different force or a different speed. So we'll not, you will not be able to compare the different samples. So that's why we modified a scratch boy. This is actually a hardness pencil tester. Um, and what we did is we replaced the pencil by a screwdriver, as you can see. And this device also allows that we set the pressure varying from one Newton up to 10 Newton. And it also has a constant speed. So in this way, if we always do the same procedure on the different textiles, we can actually nicely compare all the different um, triggers. So this is how it will looks like you in purple color, you see two type textiles which have been treated with a scratch boy on a, in a similar way. And you can see one is really already quite well decoded, the other one is not. So what we do then actually to have a qualitative measurement, we take a photograph of the sample and then we process it with the software image G and you get this after some manipulations, this black and white picture. And then you can actually calculate the percentage of the bonded area. And, and we do that for every textile sample so that we really compare the efficiency of the different triggers. When you look at some fir first insights, so first um, way is that we added the triggers to the coating layer, so to the adhesive layers. So for example, here we had a polyester fabric with a top coat um, with triggers inside. What we can already say right now is that no, not all types of particles lead to successful debonding and we also see a huge dependency on the binder type. I just gave here one example where, for example, in purple, um, we can already see, even if we don't add additives, that we already have a partial debonding of the coating. So that actually means that the coating itself does not resist to um, our trigger. So that means that also the quality of this coating could be less. So we you really have to fine tune. If we add triggers, we can improve this uh, debonding. Uh, but when you see if we add different concentrations, we already see a different effect of the debonding. So we really have to fine tune the amount we will put inside the coating, really take good care of which coating we are putting it in. So there's quite some investigation still going on to find the correct um, parameters. A second way that we are looking at is actually to put in between the polyester fabric and the polyurethane coating an additional triggerable primer. So this is the one in blue, it's the Indar primer. So on the picture you see the white is a polyester fabric, the blue is the primer and on top you can see a shiny glossy polyurethane coating. So in this case, we already saw a good uh, initial adhesion of the coating because this is also very important because during the use phase, it still has to meet the functional requirements. And we could also see upon heat triggering in the oven that we had an efficient removal of the coating. So um, if you look at the course of the project, we are now further screening different triggers and their uh, debonding efficiency. Then further on, we will also see how the, uh, the coating uh, behaves. So the functional requirements, are they still met? Because we still have this very important use phase where we need to make sure that all the requirements are met. And then if, and if last instance, we will look at the progress towards a demonstration case. So for the textile case, uh, we will focus on a bike pack. And then we will start try to demonstrate the whole loop as he presented in the beginning. Um, if you want to stay informed on the results and the outcomes of Decode, um, I could advise you that you can once in a while take a look at our website. So especially the sections events and news and updates where you can find more news on the project. So it has received funding. And I would like to finish with a quote of Delavoisier, which states that in nature, nothing is created and nothing is destroyed, but everything is transformed. And this is also actually what we are doing within Decode. We would like to transform the textile waste into new usable materials. Thank you. And I would now like to give the word to Guy um, to start the question and answer session. Thanks. Thank you, Ine. 
And we are running a little bit behind in time, but we will spend about 15 minutes for the Q&A session. Okay. Thank you. And first of all, also thank you for the many questions that we're receiving. I think we best go chronologically to the speakers. And so Edwin, from the different questions, I think two things that come a bit more often back is, first of all, uh, can you explain a bit how to separate the different materials? Like if there's a blended material, sometimes you have fibers from animal or origin or from plant or uh, man-based made. And the other one is about the economical feasibility of the different recycling processes. I guess it might be more difficult, but are there already some processes that can compete with yeah, virgin material? Um. The first, uh, if, if you have blends, in some cases, uh, there is no issue. Uh, for instance, Econil is able to, to tackle a small percentage of um, elastane uh, within, within a recycling process. Uh, if, if it's too much, uh, you might dissolve uh, the elastane first before recycling then uh, the, the uh, polyamide. The issue is with dissolving to, to keep your material uh, as much as possible intact so that you can reuse it and don't destroy it completely. And then um, sometimes volumes, or I'm convinced that volumes might be an issue. If you have very small percentages of certain fibers that, that um, are causing a problem uh, to, to, to get them out. Secondly, uh, regarding the economic the feasibility of, of the recycling techniques. And um, for instance, um, Dr. Green, the, the, the fabric from uh, Utex Bell, they're convinced that with optimization and in a certain period, they will end up within the same price range as the virgin material. But of course, at the moment, uh, recycled materials are uh, in most cases much more expensive than the virgin materials, but um, European Union is looking into a tax shift, uh, which might make uh, virgin materials much more expensive than recycled materials. So I think uh, le legislation might bring a solution in the future. I hope that answers the questions. Difficult for me to answer, of course, in name of the, the people who asked the question, but for me, I would say yes. And if not, be, please all feel free to add additional questions to this topic. Um, in the meantime, we'd also go to two questions for Klima. And the one part is um, with respect to circularity, it's clear that, let's say, it's an attention point for Vaudé. But uh, somebody asked, do you also get actually specific requests from customers on circularity? And if so, do you have an idea? Yeah, let's say, can you measure that interest? Is it a sporadic question? Or do you have the feeling it's, let's say, a large part of the people you know, that come back to you with that question? So I think we we see that really as a, as a mega trend when we do some kind of a poll, that it's an interesting topic for a, a lot of customers, but real feedback um, about circularity, I would say is more punctual, like really from specific customers who write back to us asking about this specific topic. Uh, my, I would say our feeling is more that uh, at the moment, there is a big confusion about all the terms that the, the, the consumers or the users have to deal with regarding recycled material. What does it mean? Is it recyclable? And there's a lot of uh, confusion in this field. Um, I would think that a lot of customers already believe that everything is being recycled in the textile when it's uh, not the case. And there is also um, some greenwashing happening sometimes. So uh, it, there's definitely one one thing we are, we've identified is we have to work a lot on consumer education so that they really understand what it is. But yeah, to sum up, it's, uh, I would say, more sporadic, but uh, kind of trending. Okay, thank you. And then another question was, um, you mentioned like the initiatives to help to repair, also to encourage people to bring back clothing at end of life. 
Do you also participate in actions, for example, that people get a voucher or other incentives, how to motivate people to bring back? Hey, you're freezing, but uh, I think I understood the question. Um, so I think that's for us one of uh, the main uh, problem here is kind of the business model. We sell a lot of our products through retailers. That means like Intersport, Globetrotter, other big shops. And we just have a few franchise shops of our own. So one big limitation is we don't have like a place or a lot of places where people can bring their products. So they, uh, when we uh, collect the clothes, you have to send us your product. And of course, uh, for us, the discussion was more, do we cover the cost? Do we not cover the cost? Um, at the moment, we do not yet. But I think like between a voucher and uh, something more similar to a deposit system, this is something we are also evaluating. Um, as I said, we have uh, big discrepancies between how, what is the business model of the company, uh, what is the, the value of the product. And we have also jackets which cost 300, 400 euros. So if we give 20%, uh, that's uh, completely different from a, Twenty dollar, a twenty euro T-shirt. Um, so yeah, at the moment it's still something we we're trying to define, but uh, there's uh, very little transparency overall. What would make more sense? I have a question maybe to all of you. Um, there was a question of: Do we have an idea where there could be a commercial plant for textiles? Yeah, maybe I can bring. A point here uh, about that. This is exactly also something where, where we see we have uh, some kind of um, logistical issue. At the moment, most of the textile are still produced in Asia. Mm -hmm. And uh, for us, the main market is Europe. So we use and recycle the textile in Europe, but at the moment, they still produce in Asia. So that's the question. Uh, if we want to make a real closed loop, uh, we, we still have problems in terms of logistics. Yeah, thank you. And in the meantime, he is back, so he can take over again. Okay. There was also a question to Katarina. And that was that uh, somebody mentioned, okay, it's very nice to see all the good intentions and efforts to recycle. But of course, the recycling process itself also costs effort. So. Is there a net saving, for example, of carbon emission from energy? I think it was put more in general, but I guess for Creasol, it would be a relevant question. Yes. Um, I don't have any numbers, but um, this is exactly the reason why we want to make, um, make uh, why we want to preserve the polymer chains and not degradate them. Because by preserving the polymer chains, we um, save the energy that is needed to first um, produce uh, to, to to produce the material again. So with chemical recycling, you use energy to depolymerize the material, and then again you have to spend energy to polymerize them again. And by um, conserving the polymers, this is exactly what um, makes the energy saving, and the the energy we need to spend on the recycling is significantly smaller than the energy that is. Um, used to produce them again so of course this is the sense of the um of the whole thing <laughs> and maybe i can also comment on that so also that's why within the project of decode we're also doing a life cycle assessment of all our options also to see how it will behave in the end to have the broader view on of all the different methodologies but this is still ongoing of course Thank you. I would also say more in general, I think it depends a lot on the material. Like I know there are some numbers out there, for example, on chemical recycling of polyamide, of polypropylene and so. For some materials, it makes definitely more sense than for other. Um, but I agree with the question, not in all cases, uh, food chemical recycling might be the best option so with that respect. Then we still had one with respect to uh, Creasolf that was related. You mentioned that there are commercial plants being built for uh, packaging material more, for the plastics part. 
do you have any idea if there would also be a commercial plant coming for textiles in foreseeable future or too far away? Well, we do have activities towards textile recycling, but I think the act activities are not as proceeded that we are right now planning to build a plant, but I wouldn't um, exclude this option. So we have to see. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We hope Decode can perhaps contribute a bit to that. So let's hope. And for Ine, um, one question was, of course, it can be a nice idea to add additives to a coating, but yeah, there could be drawings. Is it easy to do that or do you really have to change seriously, let's say, the coating system to make sure these additives can be integrated? No, it's really simple. It's just when you make your formulation, you blend in an additive. It's like you would blend in a flame retardant in your formulation or, or a filler. or So it's really easeable. You don't have to alter your machinery. It's the standard um, textile processing machine like coatings or things like that. So there's no big investments needed. It's just putting an additive in your formulation. That's it. Of course, fine tuning in a little bit and with some dispersing agents and things like that, but nothing major. Okay, thank you. And then one related also in that area. To make these things uh, commercially available, what would be uh, the main bottleneck and what would be then the time scale for that? Of course, many of the triggers we are using right now uh, within Decode are custom made by the University of Athens. Also, we um, so they're really now lab scale. We have one partner in the consortium, Devan, who's actually making micro capsules at uh, industrial scale. So there is an option to really upscale some of the particles within the consortium. Um, of course, if there are other additives, um, then we have to look maybe for a third party also to really do the big upscaling. But at first hand, it will be Devon who has the chance to upscale them. Um, also partner Rascal with Indar technology. This is already commercial available also. Um, now it's more focused on plastic parts, but they're now expanding also to textiles. So in that case, I don't see a problem for commercialization later on. Um, yeah. But of course now, and for example, the additives I showed in the Ecomi text project, the carpet, which is separating, these are actually commercial available additives already. So that's the major difference between Decode and the previous projects. There we had to work with what we find already on the market. These are additives were not designed for recycling, but for other um, properties. And here we will just, in Decode, we make them ourselves really with the purpose of recycling. Hope this answers a little bit the question. <laughs> yes, thanks a lot. Then perhaps one thing more in general um, to end. In the, I think it's also triggered by what Mauro presented about that there will be um, you know, not guidelines, but actual legislation on the eco design and so on. There were in the beginning quite some questions around that. What can be the role of eco design? Mm -hmm. How important is it? Let's say that part. I don't know if one of you or several of you want to give some final ideas on that. I think it really depends on the product you are producing. If it's like with the conventional material, polyester cotton, there will be ways to separate them. Then you don't really need eco design. But if you, for example, have a coating which really needs to be the bonded, yeah, in this case, you really have to think in advance. So I think it's really depending on what you are producing and, and what will technologies will be available at that point. Can react to that as well. It's, it's only useful within a value chain if, if you know what in the end uh, will happen with your product. If, if you don't uh, know that, you might perhaps take measures that are unnecessary or you may take the wrong measures. It, it really depends on your product, the value chain, like Ine said. So, and also perhaps you are now using not certain fibers. To, to, to make it possible to recycle, but in the future it might be recycled. 
to, to uh, possible to recycle those those blends. So also the technologies are uh, evolving, uh, changing so much that it will be very difficult to just put up a set of guidelines uh, regarding eco design. Okay. Perhaps also as the last one yeah. from Clément's side. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I can only add up to what Edwin and Ines said. Um, at the moment for us, it's always the question when we're working on, on those kind of topics, eco-design, do we set our requirements based on existing technologies or do we also take into account what could come up? And uh, that's like the big difference. Huh? If uh, I take the example of decode, if we say, okay, with triggers, we could have this more flexibility when it changed kind of the whole landscape. So uh, we would, in any case, welcome some kind of legislation so everyone has the same basis, basis and then build up on there. But for sure, it's going to be some um, type of evolutive document and depending a lot of, uh, yeah, as Edwin said, what kind of material. So uh, I realized not very straightforward answer and a lot of uh, <laughs> things unclear, but yeah. at least having the basis would be would be great. Yeah. No, but I think it fits it. It's, uh, I think, a quite complex issue we talk about. So I don't think they're always very straightforward. It will depend on situations and you know, specific products, value chains, and so on. So, but I think with this, um, and also looking at the time, I think it's a good moment uh, to end our Q&A session. From my side, I would definitely like to thank all the, the presenters, definitely also all the people who attended and for the interesting questions and comments that we received. And sorry if we could not deal with all the questions. Thank you.